little bit about political ecology and why that matters in the context of, of ecosystem services. And we had uh, a fairly heavy overdose of diagrams and uh, arrows and boxes this morning. So you'll get lots of words from me instead. <laughs> uh, and I promise there's, there's very few diagrams. There may be one or two pretty pictures. Um, so political ecology and, uh, is an approach that's been around. And I'm glad that Janet introduced it already in ways that are not very different to the way in which I think about them. Because if you get a bunch of political ecologists in a room, they might describe the, the field or the term or the, or the discipline in very different ways. It's an evolving field which continues to ask itself questions about what makes it distinctive. Um, but it really is trying to recognize that when we're talking about ecological outcomes, there are always political questions that underpin them. And actually, a lot of political questions have underpinning them some fundamental ecological issues. Uh, and I think the differences that I want to draw between two different types of ways in which one could conceptualize ecology. So Janet already talked about trying to identify the sort of broader systems rather than the immediate, trying to think about the underpinning social and political causes for certain types of phenomena rather than just, just the proximate. Uh, recognizing power within political systems, which influences the ways in which outcomes are determined. And you know, we talked a little bit about this in the context of knowledge and uh, whether um, power actually pervades the ways in which maybe different frameworks get chosen and selected and, and survive. And, but recognizing that there is this politics uh, in, involved in ecological choices. And being explicit about the normative positions that we're adopting. We talked a little bit again in the morning about distributionally weighted values, for instance. That's a normative position that what people might adopt. They may say we care about particular groups in society more than others. And that's a moral, ethical position that people have to be willing to discuss. And people's views might dis disagree on this. But, but that is what political ecology really tries to get to the forefront. I've been also thinking about a contrast between a term which was very prevalent in the 1990s um, that still survives. There's an international society for in industrial ecology. There's a sort of large group of people who work on this area. There's an international journal on industrial ecology, um, which I think is a sort of more sy systemic systems-based approach, but again, is very apolitical. It's technocratic. It's about achieving eco-efficiency and produces the science of sustainability without the politics which underpins that. So I think those are the ways I would contrast them. Uh, I think both are still prevalent. So when people are debating these issues in all sorts of arenas, I've been thinking about this, for instance, in the context of uh, discussions around Red Plus. I think a lot of the approaches which are very technocratic are really coming from an industrial ecology background, whereas a political ecology approach would be a lot more critical about the kinds of outcomes that are emerging from experimental carbon forestry projects, for instance. So I think there is a sort of substantive difference between taking politics seriously and not taking it seriously. Um, the approach, just to give it its historical lineage, goes back to work by Piers Blakey at UEA um, and a number of others who sort of coined the phrase. Uh, and I suppose the easiest way to describe it is that it's trying to combine ecology with political economy. Both are sort of old and long-standing disciplines which people might understand. Um, it's trying to understand the ways in which people uh, negotiate access to and the use of land, how society negotiates that. And also trying to understand that society itself is, is fragmented and distributionally uh, differentiated. So you've got classes and groups within society. You're not treating society as a homogenous whole. The state matters, and this is where political economy starts to matter. Um, the ways in which those choices are made in terms of the allocation of resources might favor some people and disfavor others. So you start to get an understanding of winners and losers, which I'm going to come back to. Um, and, and they also talk, take account of some of the spatial relationships. Uh, so that's what, what the field is trying to do. There's a, there's a good textbook by Paul Robbins, which I think I find is very um, good at explaining the different strands within the discipline for those who want to poten potentially follow up. Uh, but I've pulled out what I see as four or five core elements of it. Um, an understanding of the boundaries between state and market. It's, it's a really important part of the contemporary debate around how we organize and manage environmental resources. Uh, and that kind of picks up on the old themes of political economy and takes them forward. Other strands within it look at a more historical take of 
colonial patterns and practices that resulted in particular patterns of land use and alienation and the impacts that those had on particular groups in society. Trying to understand that in terms of the structural violence that was done in certain types of uh, uh, management systems. A third strand is uh, a much more explicitly ethnographic or anthropological strand, trying to understand the symbolic values that people assign to the material resources that they're surrounded with. And that's a sort of really important way of thinking about it, which sort of leads into this post-structuralist, did someone use the term, we don't want to end up in a morass of relativism, this, this, uh, this sort of idea of things being socially constructed the importance of discourse in terms of framing the ways in which people perceive and respond to certain types of material uh, resources. But also increasingly, and this was a challenge which was thrown at political ecologists about a decade ago, saying, well, you talk about political ecology, but where's the ecology? And, and some people beginning to respond by saying, actually, we are interested in ecology, but ecology in terms of what people might characterize as the new disequilibrium ecology, rather than believing that ecology is sort of necessarily linear and, and um, and, and uh, non-dynamic. So that's, in a sense, the sort of several strands that exist. Now, any one practitioner within this field might combine some sub-elements of this. And this is why different people might define political ecology as quite different fields. I suppose, now that I've done my introductory undergraduate lecture on political ecology, <laughs> the question is, why does this matter for what we're trying to do here? And I think, you know, it really comes down in, in, in a very simple way that one of the sets of questions we should be asking all the time is trying to understand that there are winners and losers associated with ecosystem change, which I could kind of crudely characterize as trade-offs. Things that are often presented as, let's say, improvements in ecosystem management could hide the exclusion of people from access to those same resources. And we've seen this documented in the widely written um, accounts of displacement from protected areas, for instance, um, seen, as, seen as biologically uh, creating improvements, but actually creating significant losses in terms of people's well-being. There's a separate question, which is, you might get increases in the aggregate, and Janet touched upon this, several of the frameworks we were looking at in the morning, focusing exclusively on the aggregate. So the supply of drinking water to a town increases threefold. Who gets access to that water when it's actually increasing? Is it the rich and the powerful, or is it universally distributed across the town? Do the poor get equal access? So the question about how ecosystem goods and services are accessed and distributed is fundamental to this, um, this approach. Um, and what we should always be asking is how are those costs and benefits distributed? Who are the winners? Who are the losers? And we need to look self-consciously for those winners and losers, particularly if we start to make this moral judgment about we care more about the well-being of some people than others. This is where our moral position starts to become important. So we care about the well-being of certain more vulnerable groups for particular reasons. And you put that ethical position out there and say, this is why I believe this is a change for the better. You might choose to disagree with me. Let's have a conversation about that. So this is my only diagram. This is, this is my way of thinking about why a political ecology approach might be a useful way to think about ecosystem services. And I think it has three elements. And I'm going to talk about these two a little bit more because I know we've got Paolo and Urvashi to follow to talk about the middle bit in more detail. But I think they go together, so I don't want to remove them from the frame of discussion. Um, and in some senses, these play to the three different communities that I think come together here. There's a, there's a very significant set of body of work about understanding ecosystem function, understanding how that translates into the kinds of goods and services that emerge from natural ecosystems, which picks up on several decades of work by biologists, ecologists, hydrologists. The measurement side of ecosystem services, the ecology part of political ecology is really important. Um, and there are various ways in which people do it. I'm going to talk, since this is a session about tools, about a particular tool that I've been associated with that people might find interesting. We then convert those occasionally for particular reasons into values, values which are economically uh, measured. Uh, and we can discuss the circumstances in which that's appropriate. 
And that is an important part of the discussion in certain circumstances. I think this is where the kind of issue starts to become political and interesting from my perspective, which is you then have a conversation. When those values are put on the table, that's not the decision made. That's when the decision process starts. And we negotiate, we discuss, we, 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 we talk about the trade-offs. We put the values of ecosystems against other values. We talk about ways in which management should respond to these questions. And a lot of the sort of interesting policy work is around this negotiation space. That's where the political science, the politics starts to become really important. That's where the pluralism of different people's value systems starts to become interesting. So I see that as a sort of landscape within which people uh, locate themselves. Some people do just this, some people do just this, some people do all of it, but this is a sort of a holistic way for me to think about uh, why a political ecology would work for ecosystem services. Just a sort of small footnote, I think, and I don't know why this is the case, and we need to talk about maybe rescuing the term for that reason. I have a feeling a lot of the critics of the ecosystem services way of thinking assume that it's only this middle bit and are critiquing ecosystem services terminology because they think it's all about valuation and the interventions are all about payments for ecosystem services. There's a very easy conflation of the ecosystem services way of thinking with only valuation and only payment systems. And I think it's really important to use this kind of visual representation to say it's not just that, that there's a lot more which goes on when we talk about ecosystem services and valuation and payments have their place, but they're only one part of the, of, of the, of the story. So that's a sort of little footnote because I, I see people somehow hearing the term ecosystem services and immediately telling me about what the problem with PES is. And, you know, it's kind of an, <laughs> a discussion which becomes quite problematic. So let me, let me talk a little bit about uh, a tool which people might find interesting uh, to, to, for, for measurement. And I'll give you some context. And I, I'm, I'm glad Georgina introduced tools in the morning in the way she did, which is they're appropriate to particular context. We need to think about why they were designed. And only then can you really start to implement them. Um, this is something that emerged out of a group based in Cambridge um, who came together to, to, ask, to answer and ask the question, and I, it's at least another few people in this room who were associated with the thinking and the development of this. Um, the question that was being asked was, if you're a manager at site level of a small, let's say, bird reserve, and you want to understand what are the ecosystem services on your site, what kinds of values might be assigned to that? Are there ways in which you could do that at relatively low cost with relative accuracy compared to the kinds of ways in which, you know, much more complex scientific assessment might come up with values? So it was designed for managers of these small reserves who had some scientific understanding, but not a huge amount of resource or scientific knowledge which would underpin that. And what kinds of services could we estimate with what kind of accuracy? So this emerged out of a two, three year process where a number of experts came together, lots of workshops, but all, all the time thinking about what's applicable at particular sites. Um, the paper came out in Ecosystem Services earlier this year. I brought along spare copies if anybody's interested, but you can download it and read it. Um, and the toolkit is then um, linked off that. But just a few quick aspects of it, which I think might be worth thinking about. And then I'm going to bring it back to why I think it's important from my political ecology perspective, uh, it's it's at a it's a it's at relatively small sites and scales, um, which is really appropriate for local decision making. One of the most important aspects of it is that it it compares the values that emerge from the site of interest, your bird reserve, to an alternative state. It's asking the counterfactual question, and the alternative state is determined by saying, what's a plausible alternative? Uh, maybe it's agriculture. Maybe the surrounding landscape is almost entirely agriculture. Your stakeholders get together and say, if this were not a bird reserve, the most plausible alternative would be that it would be under sugarcane or something. And then you start to say, okay, let's measure a sugarcane field and see what values you get there. And let's look at the, 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 the bird reserve. And then we start to estimate the, the values. Now, for me, what was interesting about getting involved in this process was that 
at about the same time, I was beginning to do some work on my SQL program framework grant, and we were thinking about the same question, which is, we don't have a lot of resources in the project, we don't have a lot of scientific expertise in the project, and we still estimate what's going on at our sites. And can we make that knowledge available to local communities, or actually make them participants in the process of generating that knowledge? In which case, you're actually empowering them because you're giving them the tools through which they can negotiate over ecosystem services. So my sort of hypothetical scenario is, there's a community living around a forest, somebody comes along and says, we've done a measurement using remote sensing and your forest is worth X number of dollars, that's the carbon value of your forest. Community says, actually, we've done our own measurement, we think it's worth three times X. And that's where you start to get a really interesting negotiation. Those sorts of markets at the moment are very skewed towards the buyer. The seller of the service actually doesn't have the tools or the ability to negotiate because they don't know the value of the resource that they're selling. And that's not what a typical market is. A typical market is assumed to be one in which buyers and sellers have, have perfect information. But you've got a very skewed market taking place here. So what's interesting politically about this process is if these tools work, you start to create knowledge that can be used for negotiating over ecosystem services. Um, and just another few attributes, but you, know, you can look this up on the paper. But what we then did was we went out and tested it um, in several places. One of our partners was BirdLife. One of our partners was the RSPB. So they had sites where we could test it uh, with a lot of input from the team who designed it. And it's been looked at, in, as you can see, in a wide range of places. And we've got a follow-on project, which is actually allowing us to conduct workshops in East Africa to actually help uh, site managers there learn how to use it and implement it. So what it's going through is the sort of refinements of, we started with a blunt stone to hammer, hammer a nail, we're slowly refining it and it's becoming a slightly better hammer than the one we started out with. Uh, and this is the process that we've been describing. Um, it is available, uh, people can, can, can have a look at the tool. Uh, my colleagues, Kelvin and Jenny, have been supporting us. But read the paper first. And there's one, one report reporting on its use in, in the Nepalese context. So I want to talk about measurement. But I want the reason I'm introducing it in the context of this discussion and this kind of example, and I don't think Tessa is the only one out there, is that there is a politics of knowledge creation. And measuring ecosystem services doesn't always have to be done by externally driven expert science inputs. And we need to think about this. And I think, again, the IPES context might be throwing up other examples of this, because at least my understanding going into it was that IPES was intended to try and talk about alternative knowledge paradigms to generate knowledge about biodiversity and ecosystem services. So maybe there's going to be more of this plurality of approaches coming through from those sorts of processes. And that raises really interesting questions, because we need to then start to challenge and confront our own paradigms of scientific knowledge generation and creation. The other one I wanted to talk about is, of course, the politics of negotiating over, over ecosystem service outcomes. Um, I'll reflect on this through a few examples chosen from India, which is where I do a lot of my own work. Um, and my uh, recognition that the language of ecosystem services is beginning, beginning to get used increasingly in the ways in which negotiations are taking place within the Indian context over, over, over the environment. Um, one of the areas which is very interesting, which a, which a student of mine worked on, um, India has a federal government system. And resources are transferred from the central government, the federal government, to the state governments as part of the sort of fiscal settlement process. Uh, and this is determined every five years by what's called the Finance Commission. It determines how much of the central government revenue should go towards the state governments. It's sort of the Westminster Scotland question, uh, but in magnified across 28 states and a much longer standing uh, federal system. In the last two iterations of the Finance Commission, the 12th and the 13th, the, the hilly states in the Himalayas in particular started representing to the central government that they should be seen as net suppliers of ecosystem services to the rest of the country. The major river systems of India originate in those hill states. These are critical to the livelihoods of something like 500 million people who then live in the plains uh, and benefit from the flows of those rivers. And what they said is that by maintaining those river flows, we are providing this service to the rest of the country. But in order to do so, 
those hill states are foregoing alternative development opportunities. So there's an opportunity cost associated with not developing the lands. And that is what needs to be compensated through this federal transfer system. Um, so essentially they were using an ecosystem service argument for being paid for not developing the land because that would impact on the river systems of the country. That's a really interesting context. It's not couched in the language of ecosystem services, but that's really an ecosystem service negotiation taking place. And interestingly, both the 12th and the 13th Finance Commission recognize that claim and have made awards to states on the basis of existing forest cover. That worked in parallel with processes that certainly our colleague who's about to join us or who has already joined us, Urvashi must, must be aware of, and I think Paolo might have heard about as well, uh, valuing ecosystem, valuing forest, forest resources in India and estimating the net present value of forests. A specific commission was set up in India to, to do that. That led to the creation of something called a compensatory fund for afforestation. Now, the principle behind this was, and it's a, it's a little bit like offsetting, although, again, the term isn't used in this context. If there's a development project that is converting forest land in India, it has to deposit a sum of money with, the, with, with this government fund in order to create a budget for compensatory afforestation for the loss of forest values. So if you're a hydroelectric project which is coming up and you're converting 200,000 hectares of, of forest, you have to pay a sum of money which goes into this consolidated fund and is then earmarked for compensatory afforestation. I think that's actually the offsetting principle. And it's been in operation for the last 15 years in India. The fund is very cash rich. There's been a lot of development. So we've lost quite a lot of forest. Um, and all of this has been deposited in this in this compensatory fund. I looked up the figures just before and the amount that they're planning Number to distribute. Hello? 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 Should I answer? Hello? Hello? <laughs> Hi. Yeah, I'm calling. I'm calling from World Bank. Is it ESPA? Yes, this is ESPA. Edinburgh. Yeah. Uh, it's regarding the video conference with the World Bank. Yes, we are waiting with uh, interest. We are not, It's not getting connected. Could you please confirm the ISA number once? Sorry, what was that? Could you repeat, please? Uh, no. You are the participant for the VC or you are the IT? I am. I'm not the IT expert, I'm, <laughs> but... Uh, I want to I, talk to your IT because it is not getting connected. There is a problem in connection. The IT people are hearing you. I don't think they can respond. <laughs> I, can I talk to them? Hello? Paul, would you like to respond? Can, yeah. We're going to have to cut you off because you've connected the wrong way and we can't, we can't reconnect you. Um, we'll call, we are we'll call not able to dial out to you. Your uh, ISD number, your connection is not happening. We're, we're about to switch you off, I think. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we will have a chat to World Bank. Um, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so where was I? Yeah, big fund. Lots of money in this compensatory fund for afforestation. Um, what, and again, of course, it's, it's recognizing that um, you can attribute values to certain types of forest values and estimate how much forest loss can be compensated in particular ways. Um, that budget is now being used for, uh, for funding one of India's commitments under its National Action Plan on Climate Change, which is a mission for greening the Himalayan ecosystem and a Green India mission, which has also been created, which again has a massive budget. This is all domestically generated resources. But again, and here it becomes explicit, this is one of the first policy documents in India where it starts to talk about improving ecosystem services, that terminology is now crept into the policy literature, uh, which is really interesting as well. But when you look at some of the questions that underpin the implementation of something like the Green India Mission, the questions are ones that I've certainly been thinking about in the context of forest management and forest policy in India for a lot longer than the terminology of ecosystem services. Questions about institutions, about governance, about how you finance, participation and rights, who controls, how do you manage their resource? These were questions that people were confronting when they were thinking about devolution, community management of forests, state manager of forests, all these sorts of debates. So actually these are not new questions. The questions associated with implementing an ecosystem services intervention, which is what this Green India mission is claiming to be, are actually no different 
to ones that we've thought about in the long history of thinking about the political economy of forests in India. So my point here is that ecosystem service interventions don't suddenly magically become different. There are going to be the same questions about winners and losers that we've talked about in the context of forest management previously. They don't suddenly magically become win-wins just because we're using this new language. And I've been talking at country level. Let's scale that down. So just as a sort of another example, uh, Himachal Pradesh is one of the hill states where we've been doing some work. Um, it has, again, a lot of these small hydro projects. Um, something like 500 had been allocated a, a couple of years ago. And it's often seen as desirable because it's relatively low impact. It doesn't have the displacement associated with large dams. It doesn't have the large reservoirs that are created by large dams. It's seen as a preferable alternative for electrifying rural households as opposed to the large dam alternative. But there is a downside, and this is where the trade-off question becomes important. They often involve diversion of small stretches of the river. When you divert that small stretch of river, there's a locally dependent population which loses access to water. And that often gets neglected in the discussions around these micro hydro projects. But just a couple of examples, a, a, a couple up there, and the sort of numbers associated with it. So there are going to be winners and losers in these contexts, and we need to take those into account. In those sorts of hill states, the other kinds of microecologies that are emerging, and again, these are things that I'm hoping we'll be looking at in the context of my next piece of work in this area. Um, this summer, we had a huge flood event in, in one of the northern Indian states because the monsoon rains came early, unpredictably early. There were a lot of pilgrims up in those areas going to religious pilgrimage sites who got trapped, huge loss of property and huge amount of damage. Uh, you're starting to see new ecologies of risk and vulnerability in these regions. And again, those are going to be associated with winners and losers. We need to understand those dynamics. So this is sort of where the political ecology question starts to become important. Let me just stop with a few final thoughts, hopefully to stimulate some discussion. I think what the research base, including the research base which is ESPA funded, has quite strongly demonstrated is that the ways in which people view, perceive, and value ecosystem services are often very different in a landscape. Different stakeholders have different perspectives on this. That knowledge and information about these services is often contested. And coming back to frameworks, tools, paradigms, conceptual models, we need to be sensitive to these differences. We need to be aware of and sensitive to, to, to this position of plurality that I was talking about. We also need to be aware that when we intervene in a landscape, inevitably, you're going to create a new political dynamic. The, the moment of intervention changes local institutions, changes local institutional relationships. There will be winners and losers. It's rare to find the win-win outcome. So we need to look for those winners and losers. We need to look for the trade-offs. And at least some of our work is showing that that winning and losing is not necessarily just in terms of monetary gain and monetary loss. Questions around who controls a resource, questions of power, prestige, actual management questions might be as important as the fact that people are actually losing in monetary terms. So the economic values are important, but actually understanding the entire politics of the institutional landscape is equally important in terms of understanding who might perceive themselves to be winners and losers in these landscapes. OK, I think I will stop. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. That's certainly a very different perspective. And uh, oh, Paul's here. No, he's here. No, I need to. I'm on the phone <laughs> we'll have a whip round for you if you like. <laughs> Are there any questions for Basca? Um, what's happened to the microphones? Yeah. Thanks very much. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Matt Smith, JNCC. Um, great presentation and very thought provoking. Um, I was wondering, what do you think? Under the um, on the future of global change, the potential risks of the winners or those user groups which are controlling ecosystem services have at holding other user groups or potentially governments to ransom over uh, ecosystem service control. I think there are clearly risks. I, I don't know what 
specific context you have in mind, but you know there are there are areas of of contestation in this field where um, a lot of the control rests with a few very powerful players, particularly when we start to talk about creating new markets or introducing market principles into the negotiation process, because then uh, those will get dominated by those who have the large bank accounts supporting those market principles. There's a risk there. Now, but that isn't any different, I would say, to the risk that we have with a large number of capital-driven processes. In Welcome the world. to Unified Conferencing. <laughs> the, same, the same types of, of inequalities of power which prevail in the context of agricultural commodity markets, uh, that prevail in the context of, of other trade flows, are likely to replicate themselves in these areas as well. So there is a risk. Now, this is why I kind of feel it's important to pay attention to that political economy question and not get taken in by what sometimes is presented as a rhetoric of win-win. Um, I get suspicious when we hear that because it's likely that there is some inequality of power which is underpinning that claimed win-win. So I think the first thing is to recognize that there are winners and losers because sometimes these are presented to us as, but that must be a good thing because everyone's better off. And I start to get a little suspicious. I want to find out who is the hidden loser. Maybe there isn't any, but, but I would like to investigate that first. So I think the first step would be to identify who holds the power, who is benefiting and who is losing. And then to have the discussion about, do we care about those who are losing? Because they may not be the most powerful in the system, but we can have a moral argument which says, actually, the losers are particular groups and communities that we care deeply about. And of course, society has done that. Society has chosen to protect vulnerable groups. But we need to be aware that they're being negatively impacted by our decisions. So I, I guess that's how I would see it. I, I, and I, I see a, a high risk, but I don't think it's insurmountable. We need to be conscious about those choices. Matt, you, you, you use the f word ransom in there. Did you have something more specific? Yeah, I don't know if you had something in mind. It was just when you mentioned that the people in the uplands holding control over the water flows and they were actually um, providing yeah. water, which is obviously essential to the life of, of many people in India, well, life of us all. So they have identified that there is a value to that resource and they have actually gone to the government and said, we recognize this value and we want to be paid for managing this resource. Now, in my mind, if the government of India turned around and said, A, we don't see it your way, B, or more likely, we don't actually have that money to pay you for that resource, you could find yourself in a politically charged situation where you have the controllers of the resource saying, OK, we could potentially sabotage ecosystem services unless you pay us for what we believe. That's a really good, work. That's a really interesting example. It's, it's one which I often try and talk about in specific discussions around PES mechanisms. So in a lot of the PES discussions, the supply of services is seen to be a relatively poor community which is deserving of the money that's being provided by the PES scheme. Your use of the language of ransom, what if the upstream supply of the service is the rich landowner in the landscape and is holding everyone to ransom and saying, I will not supply this service unless you pay me. The ethics of that PES scheme will be completely reversed. All the examples that we read about are these small local communities who are very deserving of the payments that are coming through. Now, of course, the, the counterpoint would be a polluter pays principle. The guy who's holding you to ransom is essentially saying, I will pollute unless you pay me not to. And the polluter pays principle says, no, actually, the law says you cannot pollute, and therefore you, the rich landowner, will be taxed or fined if you pollute this landscape. And we are entitled to clean water, right? So in our discussions of PES, we sort of assume that the beneficiary of the payment mechanism is a deserving beneficiary. And we've already made that moral choice. But your question about ransom actually makes that point very clear, that we are making an ethical judgment that this is a deserving beneficiary or a non-deserving. In, 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 when you use the word ransom, you're obviously suggesting that the upstream supplier doesn't really deserve that payment and in fact should be supplying that service because it's an entitlement of the downstream beneficiary. And it's very interesting questions. But you know, underpinning it is my political ecology question. Who is deserving of this consideration? Hang on to that, Matt. We're <laughs> going to come back and talk about that in the context of risks and so on. Quick question from Joe. Just following on from that last point, in your um, 
scheme, you had three boxes of measuring, valuing, and uh, negotiation. But in the light of your just comments just now, uh, wouldn't it be important to have a, a box between uh, valuation and negotiation that explicitly identifies the stakeholder landscape, uh, the, the distribution of entitlements and, uh, and property rights and so on, and the relative power and influence of those different stakeholders, including the, the, the formal and informal mechanisms by which they express them. Uh, and then to negotiate, because only once you've got an appreciation of that, could you then either understand or inform a negotiation process. Well, that's a this is how conceptual frameworks get built up. <laughs> so that's, that's an equivalent <laughs> data set, really, to the yeah, ecosystem but system services and evaluation. I would, I would describe the stakeholder but landscape more within. Explicitly. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, it's subsumed within that third box. But okay. you're right. You could pull it out and make it more okay. explicit, which is exactly the process of collectively building a new framework. <laughs> OK. Yeah, but you're right. I mean, we need to be explicit about who are the stakeholders and who are the winners, losers, beneficiaries, and then we start the negotiation process. Uh, I would, personally, I do that within that box, but okay. we can make it more explicit. Quick one from Janet. Thanks very much, Basco, for your talk, uh, which I really enjoyed. Um, one thing that struck me was I think you talked about uh, historical processes by which effectively ecosystem services payments have been made, even though perhaps they weren't called that. Um, for those groups who demand or, or otherwise um, receive those payments, does the concept of ecosystem services and the fact that lots of people all over the world are kind of talking about this in some ways quite new ways, does that give further traction to their claims? Do you it think? does. So in, in the particular uh, context of the Finance Commission, um, in the first Finance Commission, which was about 10 years ago, um, they didn't use the terminology. By the 13th Finance Commission, the terminology was out there, and the submissions from one or two of the states actually explicitly use the term ecosystem services in making their demand. So they can then use that particular way of framing the debate to their advantage. Um, and I, I, I can see that beginning to happen. Um, and again, with the Indian Green India Mission, again, they've explicitly used the term with, with, with intent, because they're talking about ecosystem services in that context. So I think those, those terms can be strategically used to further the interest that, that those groups have been trying to promote in any case.